This is Love Your Work. On this show, we help you make it as a creative entrepreneur. Find your unique voice, find the right mindset to succeed, and be the first to capitalize on new opportunities to make a living making your art. I'm David Cadavy. If you want to join us here on Love Your Work every Thursday, please hit subscribe on your podcast app. And to get your free creative productivity toolkit, sign up at cadavy.net slash tools. Imagine a world where we can control computers with our minds. That is the world that Ariel Garten envisions. She's on the cutting edge of computer and brain interfaces with her creation, the Muse Headband. And Ariel sent me a headband a few months ago. I've been using it to refine my meditation sessions. The headband gives me neurofeedback, and that helps me identify a relaxed, focused mental state. So while I'm meditating, I get audio feedback that is an expression of my brain's activity. And then that audio feedback helps me adjust my meditation technique. So the point of Muse is to train your brain into focusing on one thing so you can build that skill. You can carry it over into other forms of meditation, as well as to have the mental awareness throughout the day to manage your attention and manage your focus. Now, I've experimented with EEG headsets before. I bought my first EEG headset about seven years ago. The Muse absolutely blows away that experience. So in addition to being useful for meditation, it's also a clinical grade headset. It's used by neuroscientists everywhere. It measures all brain waves as well as certain movements. In this conversation, we are gonna talk about what mental cues can keep you in a meditative state. We're gonna talk about how mental cues differ from one form of meditation to another and how those cues relate to what Muse measures. And how do you develop a product with a new technology when the application is unclear? Hear Ariel's story about how Muse started as a playful experiment and then evolved into a useful product. And how do you follow disparate interests to an original idea? Ariel has a background in psychotherapy, fashion design, neuroscience, of course, as well as having many other interests. So how has that curiosity helped her arrive at an original idea And how did she see past the naysayers who wanted her to focus on just one thing? Muse is not a sponsor, but they have set up a special deal for our listeners. If you use the code loveyourwork at choosemuse.com, you'll get 15% off the Muse headset, or you can buy the new Muse 2. Plus, a portion of your purchase is going to support the show. So again, that is loveyourwork at choosemuse.com. And please send good vibes my way tomorrow. I will be in Bogota applying again for my visa in person. If I happen to be rejected again, that will be bad. I will have to leave within about 72 hours. I would have to leave the whole country. And then I wouldn't be able to return again until the beginning of 2019. And I would be a tourist again. That would be a pain. And I wouldn't be eligible to apply again for another six months. So on the other hand, if I'm accepted, I can stay for three years. And that would be awesome. So if you're curious to hear how it turns out, I will keep you up to date on Twitter. Find me on Twitter at at Cadavy. Here's Ariel Garten. I'm here with Ariel Garten from Inner Axon, the maker of the Muse headband. And Ariel, uh, I received a Muse headband a while back from you guys. I really appreciate that. It's it's been great. And I noticed when I meditate, uh, what I'm going for is I'm trying to get the feedback of the bird chirps uh, in my ears. So when the birds are chirping in my ears, what's going on in my brain? Awesome. Hi. So when the birds are chirping, what's going on is that your brain is in focused attention and you've maintained that focused attention for at least five seconds. So Muse is giving you real-time feedback on your brain activity and it's translating the sound of your, your brain's activity into guiding sounds looking at when you're in focused attention and when your mind is wandering. So those delicious little bird sounds you hear are letting you know that you're actually there. You're in the meditation zone. And interestingly, when I hear the bird chirps, I end up kind of getting excited. And then sometimes I end up them falling out, falling out of that focus, Uh uh, which is a bit of a a challenge. So uh, in terms of, you know, alpha, gamma, beta, theta, et cetera, do the bird chirps represent any particular activity on any particular bands? Uh, So we actually don't take a band approach to EEG. 
early on in our experiments and studies, we were looking at you know the change in alpha band versus beta band. There's a lot of research around meditation being an increase in alpha and an increase in theta and probably theta coherence. As we started to build Muse and got further and further in the research pipeline, what we recognized is there's a range of experiences going on in anybody's brain when they're in focused attention. And over now 5 million sessions of EEG data, we actually have a machine learning algorithm that goes in and looks at what your brain is doing and makes some assumptions and then determines that you're in focused attention, not just based on your alpha, beta, theta levels, but this holistic approach to your brain. Mm, Okay. And this, that would kind of explain that in the beginning of each session, I'm calibrating the, the headband, correct? Correct. Because your brain is different every day. So it starts with a calibration period. Okay. So you're getting like a baseline, uh, a baseline reading of the activity in my brain. And you, you are reconciling that with what your machine learning algorithm has learned about what fo- this focused attention is. And that is how we're coming up with this idea of whether I deserve the bird chirps or not. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Uh, and one thing that I've, I've noticed is that um, a lot of sensations or mental cues that I uh, typically relied upon in my meditation practice, and, and I'm not particularly rigorously uh, trained in any particular meditation practice, but a lot of the sensations or mental cues that I uh, would normally think would normally make me think, oh, hey, I'm really nailing this meditation, turn out to, in the case of the muse, not be, uh, not, not bring me the bird chirps, not qualify as the focus attention as, as what muse is, is calling being in, in, in the proper meditation or being in the calm state. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Is it, is it that certain styles of meditation are more suited for muse or have I just been meditating wrong for 10 years? It's never going to say you've been meditating wrong. Um, (laughs) Muse is built very specifically on a focused attention on the breath meditation. So Mm -hmm. focused attention on the breath is one of the more most basic forms of meditation that you'll learn. You put your attention on your breath. When your mind wanders, it's your job to notice that it's wandered, and then you bring it back to your breath. And what you're looking for is single pointed focus on, it really could be anything, but we use breath because it's the most common anchor. So if you're trying to do a mantra-based meditation, say, um, that's not going to register properly with Muse because it was really just built for eyes closed, focused attention on the breath. And when you do that, it really quite sensitively lets you know when you're wandering and when you're there and offers this guide to keep you in that zone. Ah, great. Okay. So a couple of the sort of mental cues or sensations that I I typically am looking for uh, when meditating without Muse are kind of like a sensation of a third eye or Mm -hmm. that my my, my brain is sort of floating out of my head. Another one is I believe it's from the the Zojin uh, tradition. uh, This this cue of kind of like you are trying to look at yourself. Uh, You're trying to like look back into your skull in a way, but not not like necessarily that your eyes are going back, but but it's it's that sensation. Both of those definitely... um, do not get me the bird chirps. However, <laughs> the, uh, the 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 mental cue that I've settled in on and that I can keep in, in focus attention pretty uh, for quite a while is, of course, focusing on breath. But also, I think about um, as if as I'm breathing in, that the air is also coming in through my entire chest and thorax. Yeah, I, I tend to find that that kind of keeps me in the groove. Like. Is that something that most people report or what do you personally, um, what are your mental cues that you use to keep yourself in that uh, bird chirpy state on Muse? So uh, that's, first of all, totally great. What you've described is completely consistent with the Muse experience. So there's lots of different ways to meditate um, and lots of different outcomes from meditation. Meditation is a practice or training that leads to healthy and positive mind states. So some forms of meditation will give you the sensation of a third eye or give you a sense of perspective on yourself in different ways. Um, focused attention on the breath is, you know, the most basic form of meditation. It's training your focus. And once you're able to train your focus and your awareness of your own thoughts, um, then you have the mental fortitude to move on to different forms of meditation. Um, uh, 
when you're focused on your thorax and when you're focused on the breath coming into your thorax, uh, you are specifically like you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You're focusing your attention on your breath and you're making that experience um, both rich for yourself so it's engaging and like single pointed. So you're just thinking about this thing and then you are in that zone. And what that allows you to do is keep your mind out of your wandering thoughts and know that you now have the ability to control your attention and to put it on one thing and to say, nope, I don't need all those other things. I don't need those other thoughts. I don't need those other sensations as they're arising. I have the choice where I want to put my attention. And that's a super powerful tool. Um, For me, when I'm meditating with Muse and like really my cue, the thing that I can do to get into the zone is to actually imagine the space just inside my nose. Often people tell you, imagine the tip of your Mm -hmm. nose. For me, it's sort of the airway just inside my nose. And that's Mm -hmm. where I end up putting my attention. And that's when I like get into my focused attention zone. That's my easy, easy jump. Yeah. And it, it's, it's funny when you find that right mental cue, you can really kind of stay in the groove and have a whole session that, you know, 93% calm or whatever, because you get a score yeah. uh, when, when you're, when you're done, which is really interesting. And I've, you know, I've been able to track and I, I can see that I've uh, meditated a little over 400 minutes with Muse so far. So I believe that's, you know, somewhere around eight hours or so. Um, can you talk a little bit about the the Muse application and how you've uh, designed it to, to help people begin and maintain a meditation practice? Sure. So Muse, as you've heard, is built on a focused attention on the breath practice. And the metaphor we use is your mind is like the weather. So when you're thinking, distracted, ruminating, you actually hear it as stormy. And so when your mind is wandering into thoughts or off of your breath, you hear the storm pick up. And as you come to focused attention, it quiets the storm. And when you're really quiet, you hear, as you've heard all about, these mythical birds. Now, I know you mentioned that uh, you'll get excited about the birds and then they'll fly away. That's exactly what's supposed to happen. Um, We actually put in the birds as a mechanism to sort of undermine the goal-directed nature of this. Meditation in and of itself is a goalless experience, even though there's stuff you're quote unquote supposed to do to do the practice right. Um, We don't want to get people engaged and being excited about rewards. So we've got the birds there. So as a novice, a bird comes down. um, First, when it happens, you don't know what it is. So it just comes and it goes. Then when you know what it is, you get super excited about it. And then it flies away because you're immediately kicked out of your state. So it's our little kind of subterfuge or trick to help you unlock from uh, any the sense of reward or goal-directed behavior and recognize that your rewards are as fleeting as your failures. And it behooves us to not, to not get invested in either of them. And I was just recently watching your, your TED Talk, or, or at least one of them. Uh, and I don't know if you've had more, but... Uh, I've had a few. Yeah, it was from 2012 or so. And it looked like there were, you had quite a few different applications going on for, for Muse. And, and you've really uh, homed in on this, uh, this meditation application and helping people with uh, a meditation practice and getting that bio that biofeedback. Bio Can you talk a little bit about the pro- progression of how you arrived at this particular use of uh, neurofeedback? Absolutely. So I started working in a research lab over a decade ago, actually in 2003. Um, I'd always been fascinated with brain waves as something that had real technical information about the world. Um, and I started working with Dr. Steve Mann. He was the inventor of the wearable computer and he had an early brain computer interface system that he had used uh, at MIT in the 90s and that we started to use to create concerts where people could make music with their mind. So they did a single EEG lead and by managing their mental state, focusing or relaxing, it would shift their brain activity and we could translate that into sound. And now we had 48 people at a time creating concerts with their brain. And I stood back and I said, oh my God, this is amazing. We're controlling the world with our mind. The world needs to know about this. And frankly, as an entrepreneur, I I think this is really commercializable. So I got together with uh, Chris Amini, who was a brilliant engineer and Steve's master student, and Trevor Coleman, who was a friend of mine who's really into business and marketing. And together, we would get together regularly in Trevor's basement, coming up with plans and ideas for business that didn't yet exist, for technology that we weren't sure how we were going to use. So the first thing we did was we wanted to show people the power of their mind to move physical objects. And we created something called the levitating chair. 
as you would sit inside it and hook yourself up to an EG, the chair would actually rise to the ceiling. And then as you would clench your jaw and create a bunch of muscle noise, the chair would come back down to the floor. And then from there, we said, okay, well, what's the biggest thing we can do with this technology? So the Olympics were coming to Canada the next year. This is now 2009. So we put together a one-page proposal with some images that we found on the internet and sent about controlling lights on stuff at the Olympics and sent it off to somebody that we knew in the government uh, and received a proposal back from them to create an installation where people in Vancouver could control the lights on the CN Tower, the Canadian Park Maldings, and Niagara Falls with their brain from across the country. Um, so we moved from a team of three people to a team of 25, took an entirely unproven technology. Um, we, we ourselves were not quite certain about and robustified it within a span of six months, created a full build out in the, in, uh, the Ontario house at the Olympics, um, wired ourselves up to the Canadian prompt buildings, Niagara Falls, the Tower, all these landmarks, and ultimately created an installation that really functioned and really allowed people to control big objects with their brain. Um, from there, we stood back and said, this is amazing, but not a product and not a business and not really very useful for humanity. You know, cool, but not functional. And we identified meditation as the thing that we wanted to move the needle on because that was going to move the needle for humanity. And we recognized we could take this technology that was letting us control technology and turn it back on ourselves and give us the ability to control our own minds, give us insight into our own mental process. And that the best way we could apply this was in meditation, because even if the tech didn't really work, at least we're getting more people to meditate. And that was a good thing. I mean, there's a, there's a, a few things that I really love about this, this whole story. I guess I'll, I'll start with this idea of a, a technology that, um, uh, makes us better. I mean, obviously, we are able to do a lot with technology, but technology, in some ways, uh, in some ways, we're technology's tool and that in that technology is is controlling us, you know, in a, in a way that, uh, you know, people are getting not necessarily addicted, but but very hooked on uh, social media and, and things like that. And it, it's yeah. something I've been thinking about a lot and talking about a lot on this podcast is, how do you change this relationship with technology and, and have technology help humanity in some way? And so I, I really love that you arrived on meditation. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, about meditation and, and what your vision is for how meditation could help humanity? <laughs> so meditation helps in so many ways. There's now over a thousand published articles about meditation's ability to improve your physiology and improve your brain's activity and your mental state. Uh, it improves your attention. It decreases your stress. It helps you improve your GRE scores. It can help stave off cancer, according to some studies. Like the, the number of things it can potentially do just continue to grow and continue to grow in their evidence towards it. Um, one of the main things, one of the main things, there's so many things, but one of the things that meditation does uh, as an entrepreneur is it helps you manage your mental state. So you learn that the thoughts that happen in your head are not things that you necessarily need to be ruled by. You have the choice to change the relationship with the dialogue inside your own head. So whenever you have negative thinking, negative beliefs that arise that typically cause, you know, a downstream physiological cascade of bit of stress, a bit of anxiety, perhaps some rumination around them, perhaps some bad decisions as a result of it. Um, you can intervene really early and say, hey, I see that I have a thought. I can really assess this thought now. Is this thought useful to me? Do I want to follow this thought train now or not? Is this threat actual? Or can I rise above it and see the landscape? Um, um, it, you know, do I need this physiological response that I'm happening or can I shift my physiological experience as a result of it? So it really helps you change the dialogue that's inside your head. And as a result, lets you, your brain direct your body in far more salubrious, health, healthful ways. And I think that one thing that excites me about uh, something like neurofeedback for helping with meditation is... I think of it like uh, the first time I ever played a guitar. I don't know if you've ever mm -hmm. played a guitar before, mm -hmm. but okay. And what was it like the first time that you uh, try to put your fingers in the shape to make a chord? I, I don't know. For for you, for, for me, it was like, this is impossible. A person this is not 
a person cannot do this. <laughs> but then over time, you're eventually able to play chords, you're eventually able to switch chords, you're eventually able to play an entire song. And so you're able to uh, bend your fingers and and in different ways that you never before thought possible. And why are you able to do that? Because when you strum this guitar, uh, you're getting feedback that yeah. whether you're doing a good job or not. And so I've seen <laughs> the same thing going on, uh, going on with this. And I feel like this might be uh, just the beginning is, uh, do you feel the same way about it? Is there, is there more to come in terms of us gaining perhaps like a brain literacy where we can, uh, have more control over, over our own brains than we did previously? So first of all, it's an amazing metaphor. I've, I've never thought of it in that way and it's completely perfect. So, uh, also, when you start to play guitar the first time, you put your fingers in the right position or the wrong position and it feels really awkward. And probably the first thought you have is, I don't know about this. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first thing we're trying to overcome with Muse where you sit down and for most people, it's this weird experience in meditation of just sitting with yourself doing nothing. Um, and you don't know what you're supposed to do with your brain and you don't know if you're doing it right. So we wanted to build a tool that Show, both shows you what you're doing and guides you into uh, one practice focused attention so that you can actually do it um, and shows you what you're supposed to be doing and encourages you and rewards you. And it's like, okay, your, your fingers are off a little bit now. Don't worry about it. Just keep doing it. Yeah, you're doing great. Yep. Just, and over time, you know, it shapes your experience and it shapes your experience to be better and better and better because you've got feedback. Um, and so it allows you to really commit to it also in the way that a teacher allows you to commit to a practice. Um, and then I guess in, in using a guitar, you don't get data after the fact, but we find that incredibly valuable as well, that you can both hear in real time what's going on. And then after the fact, see what your brain is doing and get stats and feedback that drive you. And then allow you to even look back and see your progress, um, and do fun things like say you've meditated for eight hours and feel the reward of that, and then be able to share and communicate it and, you know, have an increased number of tools for a language and a dialogue. And so all of that to say is that changing our brain, absolutely. And it's changing the way we can have a dialogue around um, these internal mental activities. Uh, you have real data that you can look at so you can point to. It's like, oh, when my brain's doing this, this is happening. Um, and these tools are still super basic, but at least they give us these you know, basic tenants that allow us to um, to have something tangible to share. And then... In doing that, in making this intangible, tangible, you're also showing somebody that they have the opportunity to control their own internal process. You know, most people just sort of go through life with the dialogue inside their head and that's just what's going on and your brain is the way that it is. And once you kind of, you know, peel back peel back the curtain and you can see what's going on in some small way, you then recognize, hold on, I actually have... I can have control over this. And that recognition is both, you know, super insightful and reinforcing because once you're able to gain control over it, you're able to do it more and more and more and then recognize more aspects of your physiology and your everyday experience that you can bring into awareness and in doing so have some dominion over or have control over or work more effectively with. Yeah, and I think that uh, a lot of interactions that we have with technology we might take for granted. Um, as an example, I, I, I recall remember seeing an older, a, a long while back, uh, an older person trying to use a computer mouse for the first time, and that 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 person was it was it was a an odd experience to move this computer mouse and to see a cursor on the screen and to make the connection between the movement that's being made by the hand and the movement that is happening on the screen. Now, of course, just about everybody knows how to use uh, a computer mouse, or maybe they don't because now it's all touch screens. Um, <laughs> are, are we on the cusp of, I don't know, that level of connection where we achieve um, such mastery over our own internal uh, thought processes, or at least interacting with computers with our brains, such that we learn to take it for granted? Or that, that uh, I would say no, we're, we're not in 
a cusp where we're right at the beginning. Gotcha. You know, we're right at the beginning where we're starting to taste these things. We're starting to do, you know, have the first experiences that let you just say like, oh, okay, I can actually see what's going on in my mind during this one activity. Um, oh, okay, I can start to, you know, feel what it's like to control my brain in this one way. Um, so we're just, we're really at the beginning. We're really basic. And when you think about even, you know, mice and touchscreens are probably pretty basic relative to what will be, what will be moving forward in the future. We're going to take a quick break. Today's sponsor is Babbel, the number one selling language learning app in the world. I can tell you that learning a new language is very hard to do, but I can also tell you that it's very much worth it. Suddenly you can travel in a new place in comfort. You can interact with new people you wouldn't have otherwise. Hey, my girlfriend doesn't even speak English. So without learning some Spanish, you know that wasn't going to happen. With Babbel, you can learn Spanish, French, Italian, German, Russian, Swedish, and more. Babbel has a great interface on mobile and web for learning. They use interactive dialogues. They use speech recognition, which is super important because you're actually speaking your new language. And they also use fun trainers and quizzes. Most important, you'll get ready for all kinds of practical situations like chatting with new friends, ordering food, asking for directions, and more. This isn't a bunch of random stuff that you're never going to use, like mis medias son verdes, uh, like my socks are green. You can try Babbel for free. Go to babbel.com and use offer code LYW to get 50% off your first three months. That's Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, offer code LYW for 50% off your first three months. And another thing that I love about this story is the fact that it seemed that you and and your co-founders were were, were playing in the beginning, that uh, you didn't know what was going to come of this. And you did arrive at uh, a product that meets a, a particular purpose and, and has um, relevance in the market. But that took a long time. Like, how long was that between the experimentation and arriving at a product that you really felt good about? And, um, and what was, what was, what was it that you were telling yourself that kept you, uh, working on this thing when that wasn't clear to you? Sure. So we started with the, first concerts in the lab in 2002, 2003. We didn't really come together as Interacts on until 2008. Um, And in that time, it was always that nagging feeling of, you know, that stuff I worked with in the lab that was so amazing. And I'd go back and have additional touch points with it. Um, In the meantime, I was a clothing designer. I was selling clothing to stores in New York. I had a retail location in Toronto, became a psychotherapist. I've always been an entrepreneur and always very interested in just creating in every genre and creating particularly experiences that hopefully are transformational for others. Um, So, you know, it was always this sort of nagging desire to go back there. And we did experimentations with it, uh, Steve and Chris and James Fung at the time and I, um, various artistic experiments. We had uh, connected hot tubs. We had all sorts of fun stuff. And in 2009, we started to sit, 2008, 2009, we started to sit down in Trevor's basement and say, okay, this is a real business. We're a startup. You know, what, what are we going to do? Um, and we were always thinking really big and felt very confident about the potential of the technology um, and somehow confident in our skills to be able to create something of meaning without necessarily knowing what it was. Um, 2010, we did the Olympics. Uh, By 2012, we knew we were making a meditation device. Um, So then went to market, raised money for it, did an Indiegogo campaign, got investors. And uh, between 2012, knowing that we're going to be making a meditation device, and um, then we landed in market in 2014. So it was only two years to do all of the innovation, the experience creation, set up manufacturing. And then we've been in market from the end of 2014 till today. We're now in 2018 for whoever's listening to the podcast, whenever it is. Currently, it's 2018. Um, and that whole time, I mean, it was incredibly exciting. You know, we were sitting on the cusp of potential and knowing that the potential was going to become actual was, was tremendous. And we kept imagining things and then being able to create them. Or if we couldn't create the thing that we imagined, we discovered something along the way that allowed us to create a corollary thing that was equally as inspiring and amazing. And, you know, this whole time we could have, what we were doing really was crazy. 
Like I was literally telling people you can control stuff, technology with your mind uh, back in the early 2000s. And nobody had any idea what I was talking about. Um, and I just had this clear conviction that I had seen it and that it was possible um, and never let any negative thought get in the way that it wasn't possible. You know, raising money, uh, I no business background, no real business background. I'd never raised money. I ended up raising 18.5 million bucks from from venture investors who had to trust a five foot two girl with long brown hair from Toronto <laughs> in Silicon Valley. Um, but it was this deep, deep conviction and really this management of my own mental space that allowed it to come to fruition. Yeah. And I think that is an important thing for our listeners to to think about is that this first experiment that you did was 2002 and then became a company around 2008, 2009, went to market with a product in 2014. That's a very long time. It's a much longer amount of time than I think most people expect something to take when when they're first starting out with something. Um, and I'm, I'm somebody my, myself who have, have been doing what I've been doing for a very long time. And sometimes I'm like, wow, it's been that long. Um, what, uh, what kind of expectations did you have early on in the process as far as how long it was going to take to, to arrive at something that you could uh, put out into the world as a, as a product? And, and along the way, did you start to wonder like, oh gosh, it's, been a long time. Uh, Can I keep doing this? Uh, So nothing ever felt long. I think, you know, I probably always imagined that whatever we were doing, it was going to come to market next year, regardless of what year it was. Um, And so I think I severely underestimated the complexity of everything all the time. And that naivety allowed me to boldly go forward and attempt to do it. And then along the way, learn and relearn and edit and shift and and create, you know, bring it to the final appropriate outcome. Um, we were always really bold in our thinking and somehow we're able to execute really, really bold things. Um, and then whatever came from it always ended up being even bigger than we had imagined. Um, so, you know, I remember many years ago being in the basement of Walmart I had previously met somebody who needed to pick Deepak Chopra and they're like, I have to introduce you. And, you know, I got an email while I was in the basement of Walmart saying, hello, Ariel, this is Deepak. I would love to meet you. Um, and, you know, now they're a partner and there's there's not the same sizzle to that. But, the, you know, we ended up at the Olympics. We're like, we're a bunch of kids. What are we doing here? Um, we're doing a project that's so far beyond the scope of what somebody else would think was possible um, or is it even logically possible, but we you know, brought together and executed and did it. So I think we always had such far-reaching goals um, that it never felt long because you're always like stretching to accomplish something extraordinary and stretching to accomplish something extraordinary. And in doing so, you know, all of that added up to create something no- nobody would made before. Is that kind of the essence of your career so far? Is is this stretching for uh, an extremely audacious goal? Is this the type of thing that you usually, uh, the type of advice that you usually give uh, early entrepreneurs is to is to have a huge goal? Like, what is the um, is that what's the defining uh, philosophy of of your career so far? Um, so I'd say it doesn't make sense for everybody to stretch to an audacious goal. Um, you know, some entrepreneurs are, are tending smaller businesses that are managed more readily in a smaller way and make sense and, you know, work with an existing market. So reaching for audacious goals is not for everybody. Um, however, if you can expand your horizon and you can think big, if you're, you know, doing a local business and it's tra- targeting a local market, if you can then step back and say, what's the biggest thing that I could do and then start to draw a path to it you've already expanded your business and your business potential. Um, so that process of standing back and just constantly asking you, what's the biggest thing that I could do? How could I make the most impact? How could I how could I change the most people's lives? Continuing to ask yourself those questions comes up with really interesting answers. And then knowing that you have the capability to do it, even if it feels like you don't. I, for example, I was not a programmer. Um, I had 
did not have a formal business background. I had no MBA, no formal business education. Um, I was a, you know, tiny female in Toronto, which at that point had very limited startup ecosystem. And nonetheless, none of those things ever seemed like a barrier to me. And so I was able to hire the developers, go down to Silicon Valley, put myself out there, build the relationships, um, bring on the mentorship that taught me how to pitch and raise investment. Um, of course, most of us don't have most of the skills required to do complex things, and that's why you build teams. And if you have leadership and you have a vision that is somewhat logical and coherent, um, you'll be able to bring in people around you and underneath you in order to help execute that vision with you. So don't feel limited by the fact that you don't know how to do something or you don't have the skills and capabilities yourself. Mm -hmm. And don't be limited in your thinking. Literally at any point along the way, we could have said, this is effing crazy. We should not do this. Um, But we didn't. We persisted. And that persistence was contagious to everybody. And that passion really drove us forward. And that passion, you know, kept us working till midnight every night. Chris would sleep in the office often (laughs) because there was just, you know, it's this big thing that we needed to accomplish. And when you put that level of passion and persistence into it, it's extraordinary what your outcomes can be. Now, from the outside, uh, it, it seems like some of this is innate, this, this thinking big, this, this not questioning yourself that it's crazy. And maybe that's not true. Uh, but I'm curious to know, you know throughout this entire journey, how have you most had to change your own thinking and your own thought patterns to get where you are? Sure. So I didn't, didn't necessarily at that point. So I was never, this is the first company that I've worked in. Um, it was a company I ended up being the CEO of. Um, and so then understanding, you know, how, corporate and job structures really worked. That that was a new insight. Um, becoming more organized than I had been. I, I'm not a particularly detail-oriented, organized individual. It's not in my nature. And so then there was an entire level of you know, operations and financing and logistical management that requires a completely different skill set that was not innate to me. Um, so had to very early on bring on partners there to uh, drive that part of the business effectively. Um, and that I makes think me also- think about, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, it makes me think about, uh, for myself, I, I think it was a while before I made the distinction that I'm not just playing, that this actually is a business and there are certain ways to structure things, whether it's processes, et cetera, uh, to, to help me do what I wanted to do. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Absolutely. So, you know, for me, it's like, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, let's just do that. Yeah, let's just do that. Uh, and then when I brought in a COO, you know, all of a sudden we have a legal team who now has oversight on things and says, no, you can't actually do that. We need a contract for it. <laughs> no, you mm. can't actually hire that employee in that way. We, we need a contract for that. Um, so, you know, I'm just like always four steps ahead and just gathering the pieces as I go, um, which is pretty antithetical to the effect of running business structure. And that's something I had to learn over time. And over the last 10 years, I have learned deeply and now have deeply ingrained in me um, and now help you know, other people organize in their businesses. But it was something that ha- had to be learned along the way. Yeah, here's the thing that I see with a lot of guests that I have and also that I hear a lot about from listeners is the um, sort of feeling... Uh, like ashamed of disparate interests of feeling like, Oh, I have too many interests that don't have anything to do with each other. And I can look at your history and see that, uh, you're obviously interested in neuroscience. You had a psychotherapy practice. You did fashion design. I believe you did real estate for a while yep. as well. Um, real estate's a family business. That's, that was okay. in the blood. Yeah. And so you've done all these different things. Were there times where you thought like, Oh no, I'm just a dilettante. I, I need to really focus on, on something. And, he, and here it, it seems like, various interests, uh, whether it's art, artistic and neuroscience and fashion design in, in a wearable product, all converged to become this thing. Uh, what was that process like for you? Were there times that you questioned the idea of having varied interests and, uh, and did that change for you? So throughout my young life, I knew I had both an interest and an aptitude in art and in science. You know, in high school, I was 
the designer for the school plays and the fashion show and all the art things and the you know, uh, and acting and 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 I also was top in the class in my biology class and ended up like teaching biotechnology in high school and working a research lab on embryonic stem cell research. Um, and so I always had that narrative fed back to me about how odd it was to be capable in both art mm-hmm. and science. But for me, myself, it never felt weird. It was only the external narrative that that made me think that there was, that made me question it or think about it. And I always saw it as a strength. I always saw the ability to function in multiple spheres as, you know, being a Renaissance individual, you know. Mm-hmm being able to have mastery over multiple parts of the world. And ultimately it came together incredibly effectively because it allowed me to build this tool with very deep technology behind it, you know, based in neuroscience and engineering, that also is this beautiful transformational human experience that feels amazing, that you know reflects your own mind. And uh, what I say to anybody who feels these multiple poles in multiple directions is, you know, run with those directions. Don't feel like you need to focus on one thing because particularly if you're young, they will come together at the end and make you broader and richer and more capable to, um, to excel in multiple domains. It's a great thing, not a bad thing. Um, yeah. So when you were hearing you know, the, the, the naysayers from the outside on that and you were, and you, but you felt very, natural about having these disparate interests. Uh, how did that uh, affect you? Did did you have uh, an opinion in your mind like, wait, they're completely missing th- this thing that makes me think that this is going to work out? Or was it strictly uh, an internal uh, feeling of security? Or was it some other thing? Uh, it was an internal feeling of security. Um, certainly when you get to different choice points in your life, you have to then make a decision which way to go. So, you know, when you go to university, it, I remember the sensation of battle. Do I go focus on the arts or do I focus on the sciences? Um, and I chose to focus on the sciences thinking that, you know, you needed to actually build a deep foundation in that. Um, whereas the art I could go back to. I actually figured I'd probably do a neuroscience degree and then go back and study fashion as my postgrad. Um, it turned out that in the middle of my neuroscience degree, I was also, you know, still in the school place at university, ran an art gallery out of my home, um, you know, wrote. Uh, and by the time I graduated, had my own line of clothing that I was starting to sell. Um, so I, I didn't choose one. I just continued to really do it all. Um, and that, uh, you know, certainly I had other people tell me that I needed to focus, but I was just it was so antithetical to me. It was just not going to happen because it felt so Mm -hmm. constricting to close off one option. So I just played out all of the options all of the time. And as you played out all the options, did, uh, did the path become more clear eventually? Did it, did it present itself among amidst all that chaos? So chaos from, you know, the outside opinion, at least. Yeah. Um, I would say only in hindsight, Like only in hindsight, can you go back on your own story and say, oh, well, this is the point when this thing happened. You know, while it's happening, you don't know that it's going to be the seminal thing. Um, So obviously from here, Muse is the thing that drew together these disparate interests and became the aha. The prior to Muse, I had a fashion line where I talked about science through fashion and I made, you know, clothing with growing fungal patches with your EEG on it and, uh, with Hmm. using principles of physics. Um, So I, you know, was always weaving the two of them together. But in retrospect, Muse is that aha moment. Would I have known while it was happening that Muse was the aha? No. You know, did I know at the beginning when I started? Because you would have just done it then. (laughs) So so we are always rewriting our own narratives. And I'm sure there will be some other future thing that I do that will, you know, then reshift the entire narrative. Right. And Muse will just become a a stepping stone in the direction towards that thing. Yes. And I've been playing with, I believe it's the Muse One, right? And uh, by the time this conversation is out, there will be this new Muse out. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Wow. It feels like I'm having a baby all over again. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So we've been in the production on an incredible next step forward in our technology. So Muse, now we refer to Muse One, um, is a brainwave-based technology where you're hearing in real time what goes on in your brain. 
We have just released a second device, Muse 2, which has an additional additional sensor on it to detect your heart rate that can also give you real-time feedback on your heart, on your breath, and on your movement during your meditation. So we can really track each of these physiological signals, teach you about them, allow you to do these really beautiful experiences that engage you in different parts of your body and help you deepen the relationship between yourself and your physiology and the outcomes that can bring. Wow, that sounds very cool. So be, beyond this, do, what kind of a vision do you have for um, this interface between our brains and, and technology, at least at Interaxon? So ultimately, we're trying to allow people to understand what health and wellness means for them and to create experiences that allow you to tap into your own health and improve your own wellness. We're particularly interested in brain health. So, you know, now it's a meditation experience that's really powerful, but over time, being able to track your brain in real time and give you more information about your brain and your brain health um, and Mm -hmm. find cues that let you improve your brain's health. And from a physiology perspective, you know, looking at your heart, looking at your breathing, looking at your movement, we now have a 360 concept of you. Um, so that we can engage with you and help you move yourself forward. Very cool. Yeah, I've actually been using the Muse, uh, using a, a, a third-party app called Muse Monitor uh, to monitor myself, not even uh, just when I'm meditating, but just the other day during a writing session, I collected some data. I still have yet to chart that. Uh, I, I'm interested to see you know, how, how different mental states of doing different types of work uh, track to what's going on in my brain, uh, at least according to what what Muse can measure. So I'm really excited to see where things continue to go. Um, Yeah, do you have a a final message or a final thing that you would uh, like to tell our listeners uh, to wrap up our conversation today um, and and the things that we've talked about? We've talked about a a lot of things about, um, I guess, making Muse happen, through through play and exploration that might be on that theme? So whatever it is that you want to accomplish in your business, um, of course, play and exploration are, are incredibly key. Um, being able to understand your physiology and your thinking and the barriers that it creates um, is another key. So as you find yourself, you know, it's like, okay, I really want to make this piece of art today or I really want to sit down and write this report. And you might feel a bit of sensation arising of like, oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, I don't know about this. Um, That is then a cue for you to be able to take a look at that sensation and examine it and say like, hey, do I, like, the sensation is just fear. Do I really need this fear? Is there really anything to be afraid of in writing this document? And if there is something to be afraid of, it's, you know, maybe that I might fail. It's not really something to be afraid of if I don't fail. I don't try, you know, if you don't try, I can't fail. Um, and so you can use techniques like meditation to help you move through those fears and help you move through those physiological reactions to actually accomplish the stuff that you want to. And then when you get in there, play, play, play. Great. Thank you so much, Ariel Garten. It's been an honor to talk to you. You're a really exciting and interesting entrepreneur. And I would encourage listeners to pick up a muse or a muse too. Is it at choosemuse.com? Is that correct? You got it. Yep. Choosemuse.com. And and we have a, a discount code set up, actually. If people use Love Your Work, they'll get 15% off. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for letting me share. It's so exciting. Great to have you. Likewise. Is Love Your Work helping you find your unique creative voice? Does it bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to become the creator and human you want to be? If so, please be a part of making this a special and nourishing and thoughtful show. Support the show on Patreon. You'll be an even bigger part of this show than you already are. If you contribute just a coffee a month, you'll be helping support the hosting and production of Love Your Work. Everyone has some unique creative gift to offer the world. Together, we can give people the tools they need to bring that work into the world. The world will be better off for it. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash This is a different kind of model for supporting the work you love. The choice is yours. Vote with your dollars, put your money where your mind is, and keep Love Your Work going. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cadavy. As a thank you, you'll get early access, bonus content, and a discount on Love Your Work merchandise. 
Learn more at patreon.com slash cadavy. That's patreon.com slash K-A, D as in David, A, B as in Victor, Y. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our Patreon supporters, such as mini sponsors Roxana Maynard of Agility Alchemist at agilityalchemist.com and Julian Power of julianpower.co, as well as top supporters such as Jeffrey Mason and Vitas Pankovicis. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs>